Right, so for the next like uh, 45, 50 minutes, I'm going to do two UWP sessions back to back. Um, sort of kind of split between focusing on some of the great cool XAML and tooling features we've got coming up and also looking at some of the more interesting APIs in the, uh, in the WinRT API set. So um, starting by thinking about how you can enrich your apps with some of the great new features we've got coming in the Anniversary Edition SDK. We've also got this, the UWP being this platform across all of our different devices. One SDK, one set of tooling, uh, and one store and a cloud service behind all this, and great tools for building an adaptive user interface. And there are a whole bunch of great new features we've built into the UWP coming up for the anniversary um, edition. Um, some of them, just some of them picked out there, but we've gone and been through and looked at all of the new APIs and uh, all the new changes we've got in there, and it's over 2,700 improvements are coming in this new update. So I could start going through all of them, but we'd be here for a very long time. So I, instead, we've just picked out a few of them that we find really interesting, uh, and hopefully you will too. So we're going to look at these. First of all, Composition, which is a new uh, API set for uh, doing high-performance high, uh, graphics in your applications. We're going to look at App Extensions, which is an interesting way of another, another facet of app-to-app -app communication, of app cooperation, where you can actually have your app as a kind of like a platform that you or other developers could extend with additional capabilities. We're going to look at handling web links. So this is a kind of a common, a big ask for people, whether you, they've got a, you've got a, a campaign out to drive usage of your app, and you're sending emailings around, and in it you would include links, which in the past would take you to the website. But wouldn't it be great, and we get asked this a lot, if instead of taking you to the website, instead it would take you straight to the app if the app was installed. So we've now got that capability coming up. I'm going to look at a few features we've got in the store um, uh, around engaging with users that's coming up as well. So the first one, let's have a look at Windows composition. So this was actually a, um, uh, the first, we, we had a preview of this right back in uh, the first release of uh, the UWP, Windows 10, back last summer. Uh, but that was just preview. And then the first proper release to uh, market was uh, in the uh, 11, November 2015 update. Uh, but now in the anniversary SDK, we've got a whole bunch of great new stuff coming along as well in this layer. So the idea here is that you know, if you're right, working right down at the low layer, layers of uh, graphics programming, this is where all on, on the system, this is where all the kind of real hard work goes on. All the very low level composition and text rastering, all the shape drawing, vector rasterization, and ink rendering all happens down right down at the low level, the graphics layer on a Windows 10 system. And if you're at the other end, if you like, the kind of easier end of interacting with this stuff, we've obviously got frameworks, such as the XAML framework, which has a lot of features in it that do allow you to do animations, storyboards, and the like. You can do so a certain number of visual effects there, fades, opacity, and that sort of thing. You can do those sort of things at the framework layer, the controls. But what we are seeing more and more is that there's actually a space for something in the middle, something that where you can have much more control, get closer to the GPU, programmatically do some more interesting effects that are actually kind of too hard to do in XAML, and actually, probably from a programming point of view, too complicated to do down at the bottom. So the programming layers we've got there is that if you write down programming at the bottom, we're talking about working directly with DirectX. And of course, at the top, we're in windows.ui.xaml, storyboards and the like. So this new layer is this visual layer is the windows.ui.composition, which is a, a new focus. So it is a, it is a new animation framework. Uh, it's code only at the moment, but we're looking at extending a, a lot of these features up into XAML in the future. Um, and uh, this is where you can do some interesting stuff that's just not possible in XAML uh, without too much effort, not the effort required to work right down at DirectX. So this is it, and this is what I'm going to have a quick look at. Now, the key thing about here is that everything is happening on the GPU. So you're getting 60 frames per second, that sort of holy grail of really good uh, performance animations, and all GPU accelerated. And it allows you to do things that we can't do in XAML, such as blurring, lighting effects, um, and an interesting thing called expression animations, where you can actually uh, chain uh, animations 
through uh, expressions from one element to another. And I'm going to show you an example of that uh, uh, um, right now. OK, so let's uh, switch over to this demo machine. First of all, let's look at um, blur effects, um, and uh, I'll show you how that works. So I'm just going to run this. It's uh, an app from our old friends Contoso. Just run this and watch as this starts up now. You see there, we've got a nice blurring effect, and uh, uh, that was applied to the background image on this page. So let's show you how that actually is achieved. So first of all, the, uh, the actual main page.xaml doesn't have a huge amount on it. We've got um, a relative panel. We've got an image here with our background image, and then a bunch of other assets on there. And we're going to come and back and look at some of that. Let's have a look at the code behind here. And let's walk through some of this stuff here um, that we, we've got. Uh, what's going on. So first of all, in our main page loaded, we use this class element composition preview, which is in windows.ui.xaml.hosting. And this is enable, this is your kind of route into the visual layer. And we get the visual for the page for this. And then we want to get the compositor, which is the object we then use for composing uh, animations on that visual layer. Next thing we're going to do is new up a Gaussian blur effect. So this is one of those effects that's really rich and very impressive, but actually very hard. It's, it's, it's complicated and it's machine intensive if you were to do it um, uh, uh, on the CPU layer. But we're going to do this on the GPU using composition. And in this blur effect, we uh, set up a number of uh, arguments on it. We give it a name. It's called blur. The blur amount, we're going to initially set that to 0, but we're actually, that's the thing we're going to animate. Um, we set a couple of optimizations and a border mode. And then we have a source, which we're configuring that to be actually a, a parameter that we're going to plug into this blur effect, Gaussian blur effect object. So that's our root object. Next, we want to get, use the compositor to create ourselves an effect factory. And we plug into that effect factory that blur effect that we've just configured. And then the next thing is a string array which is this guy here, where we give it a list of the properties of the, uh, uh, of the effect that we want to animate. And in this case, we're going to animate blur.blur .blur amount. And from that factory, we create ourselves a brush. And the brush is what we want to apply to do all this. Now, every uh, composition has an easing function. So any of you who've worked with XAML storyboards will be familiar with easing functions. It's where you can, you can sort of uh, have the effect applied linearly or on a, on a graph or you know, logarithmically. So you can actually change how an effect is applied. We're going to force this to be applied using a linear easing function. And then we need to define the time scale for our animation. So for this, we create on our compositor a scalar keyframe animation, which is very similar to a XAML storyboard, where you have keyframes in the time span that this is applied over. And you apply different sort of uh, values at certain of these keyframes. So first of all, the first, the first one is with a scalar keyframe animation. It starts, of course, at zero time. And then we're going to insert a keyframe at 1f. So 1f is this is a normalized scale. So by 1, we're saying, OK, I want you to put a keyframe in at the end of the time scale. We haven't said what that time scale is yet, but at the end of it. And we're going to apply, at that point, 100% of this linear. And we're going to use this linear easing. So we're going to animate effectively from 0 to 100% using a linear easing function. We're then going to set the time span. So actually, that, uh, this is going to happen over six seconds. Uh, and then on our, uh, on our brush, our blur brush we, we created before, we um, start the animation. Like again, we're animating this blur.blur .blur amount, and we're using that blur animation that we've just configured there. So this is where the animation gets started. We're then going to tell it what to apply this to. So that source parameter that we configured right a bit higher up, that source, the name think and name source, where we need to say, OK, what do we want to do this against? And what we're going to do with a blur effect, you need to create a backdrop brush. So that's going to take the backdrop of the page and apply it to that. Now, the last thing to do is to create a sprite so we can actually add it into our visual tree so it gets actioned. And what we do is we use our compositor again to create a sprite visual. The size of our sprite visual is the width and the height of the window. 
So full screen effectively. The brush is the brush we configure just above. And then finally, we insert this as a child visual into the visual tree and apply it to the background image. So that's it. I mean, you know, there's, there is, granted, there's quite a bit of code in there, but uh, there's a lot of samples that will lead you through. This is just one of the effects you can do with the composition. And I'm sure you agree the effects are, are, are pretty nice. There's a simpler example just below where we animate the op opacity, which, frankly, you can do in uh, a, a XAML storyboard, but this is doing it with a composition layer. Uh, and similarly, we get an element, we get the visual of the background image. We create a scalar keyframe animation again. Insert a couple of keyframes, set the duration three seconds this time, and this time we're animating the opacity. Um, so this one is kind of one of the built-in simpler, higher level ones, so we don't need to have all that Gaussian blur brush stuff. And just to run it again, just to remind you what it looks like, the effect of all that is an effect that you just couldn't do uh, with pure XAML. So that's pretty nice. That's very nice. Now, of course, not everybody is going to want to use these kind of effects for, for this kind of thing, for blurring. You, you might want to use high-performance uh, graphics for other reasons. And if you think about a scenario such as, I don't know, a dealing room system where you've got a very busy visual screen, you've got uh, flags changing color, very, and the information is changing rapidly, and it's very rich and informative. And you, it's kind of a challenge for a traditional graphics system to make that really work very well. So um, I've got another, another demo I can show you here, which also uses composition. It's called Gears. I'm just going to run this up first. So at the moment, this is uh, we've got a couple of buttons at the top, a few buttons where we can uh, change things. I'm just going to start it animating just by clicking this slow button. And we've got this nice cog that's just rotating gently. And um, let's add another one to it. And when you add another one, it goes on and starts rotating in the opposite direction. Um, and in fact, we can let's add a load of these guys. Now, it's unfortunate for me at the moment. If you were running this yourself on your own system um, at full your full screen resolution, you would see in the top right-hand corner the frame rate, and it would be saying this is running at 60 frames per second. Now, unfortunately, when we're going through a projector like this, they must uh, the framework guys must turn that off if you're not running your your system at full resolution because you can't see that. But you have to take my my word for it. It is animating at 60 frames per second. It's all happening on the GPU, so uh, it's uh, it's very efficient and uh, very low impact on your system. Um, and in fact, let's add a whole bunch more of these. Let's add another. So hidden behind the uh, XAML uh, things up there, hopefully I typed in 500 there. I can't be sure what happened, because I can't see it. Let's just uh, get rid of that guy. OK, let's type in here, 500. There we go, add X gears. So now we've got 510 of these things uh, going. Um, so that's quite a lot of rich uh, animation. And let's just have a look at the, uh, the task manager to see exactly how, what the impact is of this, uh, this, uh, all this expensive animation going on. Well, as you can see there, we've got actually uh, only 2.9%, 3.5% CPU, because everything's happening on the GPU. So this is a uh, low impact on your system. Let's, let's um, let's rotate them way faster. There we go. We've got loads of these things going faster and faster. So, um, and check the uh, usage again. Well, we're still only at 5%, 4%. Really no impact on the system. All right, let's really try and uh, make this go. Let's add another 500 and another 500 and yet another 500. So all these things, now we've got masses of these gears all going. And, well... We Again, if the frame rate was showing, it would still be 60 frames per second. Um, and the CPU, 5%. Nothing. It's nothing. All happening on the GPU. Very, very efficient um, and uh, a great way of making uh, high, high quality animations. Let's have a look at the code to see a little bit of an insight into uh, how that worked. So let's first of all start with um, uh, when we add the first gear. Here's um, add gear click. So this is where the first where I started that. We do this by creating an image, a bitmap image. So we just got a gear.png that we're using for that. Uh, we new up an image object, and uh, we give it a nominal width and a height and a render transform origin. Uh, we set the coordinates of where it should be. Now, the code in this thing, 
it does a perform layout calculation. Let's just have a quick uh, peek of that. So perform layout animation, it, it kind of figures out where in the container to position it, basically. So every time you add a new one, it's going to position it in the right position and lay them out across the screen. And then we add this gear to the container. The container is, um, is just a canvas control on a, in a XAML canvas control in our UI. Um, and then we add that gear visual, add gear to the, to the screen. And then we configure the gear animation. Let's have a look at those two methods. So first of all, add gear to the screen. Well, this is, our, again, using our element composition preview. We get the visual for our gear object. We size it, which is relative to how many are on the screen, um, set an anchor point, and just simply add it to our collection of gear visuals. So we've got a collection of these guys. And then we can configure the gear animation. So this is kind of interesting. So first of all, uh, this configure gear animations has the current visual object, is what it's configuring, but it also has passed in the previous one in the, in the sequence. And what we do is we have a, um, we're creating an expression. So first of all, we're looking for this, which is an expression animation, part of the composition API set. Um, first of all, we see if it's, n if it's null or not. If it's already been initialized, we don't do anything. But if it's null, that's what this operator means, then we use the compositor to create an expression animation. And this is kind of interesting. It's a string. We are animating the rotation angle in degrees. Uh, and it's going to be minus the value of the previous gear. This is kind of weird syntax. But what we're going to do then is say this is kind of a symbolic value in here, the placeholder parameter. So this is what we call a reference parameter, previous gear. So we're saying, actually, what this means in this expression, previous gear, means this object, this one that gets passed in. So that's what this statement is doing. And then. This is how we make, manage to make them animate backwards, you know, in reverse to each other. So we start the animation on the current gear, and we set it to the rotational angle in degrees. We're setting the rotational angle in degrees, but using the rotation expression. So in other words, we're going to rotate it exactly opposite to the one before it. Finally, I just want to just show you quickly, um, when we start the first gear, the, um, uh, the first motor, then what we do is uh, we... Uh, Check that our animation is, is, uh, is actually, we've got an animation here. Uh, we've got a, li a linear easing function. We start a keyframe again, our animation is 0 to 1. And we just animate forever. And we're just going to start that happening. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing is, uh, when we animate fast click, first of all, we do call that ensure, ensure gear motor. So when I hit that fast button, we then set the duration of that animation to 1. If we do animate slow, we're just setting the, uh, we're only animating the first gear, which is five seconds. So five seconds or one seconds for the animation. But then we just check, select the first visual in our collection, start the animation on that one. And what will happen is then, because this expression animation is related to the previous one in the sequence, just by starting the first one, it will chain through and start all the other ones going as well. So that's why you saw this effect being applied right the way across the board to all of those, uh, all of those gears on the screen. Right, so that was, a, um, that was a quick introduction to some of the power of that composition. Um, so I'm now going to change, gears, change tacks and uh, talk about uh, another technology called App Extensions. So App Extensions is an interesting uh, interesting addition to the API set. We're going to take an example of our, our old friend, the photo, uh, photo booth app, the one that uh, we saw this morning. And the idea here is that you think of a simple selfie app like that. Maybe your first release is just, just that. You can take a selfie. Uh, but then we want to add the capability of having filters. Actually, you saw the version this morning had filters on it. You could apply different uh, uh, visual filters to it. Um, but the idea with app extensions is that you can, those filters could be supplied by another app. So it's a way of supplying content, or, or in this case, shaders, into, so that can be consumed by one app. So you, you, or app becomes effectively a platform that can be extended both by you shipping additional apps with the extra capabilities or by other, other developers doing it. Now, some of you, I'm sure, how many of you are in, uh, in the Windows Insiders program? Good number of hands in this crowd, I imagine, yeah. So you'll, you'll probably have been playing with 
edge extensions, yeah, the browser. So we've now got like translator, we've got ad blocker, we've got a whole bunch of new stuff coming along all the time, and these are browser extensions. This this technology is actually that I'm talking about here. The app extensions is exactly the same. It's the same basic platform, but they built into Edge, which is actually a you know universal platform app as well, um, and you can build it into your own apps as well. And I'm going to show you how uh, right now. Um, so the coming to the plumbing, let's talk about how this works. So first of all, your app is a platform, okay? You're going to be hosting extensions. So we, you and your manifest, you have to go in and edit this um, with the XML editor because we haven't got the UI in the in the uh, the extension editor at the moment. But you go in and edit it and put into the extensions this uh, the fact that you are a category of Windows app extension host, and you'll specify in the element there the name of your extensions. That's all it needs. It's just a symbolic name. You might then publish on a website your dev for developers what that means. You know, what is a photo ext? What do you have to do to create an, an extension for that? But it's very open. It's deliberately meant to be very flexible. Uh, and then on the other side of the uh, coin, if you want to create an app that extends another app, you are put in your own manifest that you are a Windows.app extension. You have the same name. It's got to be the same name. But you have a couple of other attributes you put in there. First of all, the public folder. So you will have a folder in your application which will have some stuff, whatever it is. It could be data files, could be graphics, could be binaries. You know, that, all, that sits in that public folder, and that's where it is. And this is when this um, extension is loaded in, the host app knows to go and look in that folder to go and get the content. How does it find out when something gets available? Well, there's this app extensions API. There's a lot of methods in it. It's in the Windows.ApplicationModel.App extensions. And the host, first thing it will need to do is open the app extension catalog, which is a system kind of library catalog. And it will open it specifying the name of extensions that it's interested in, PhotoExt in this case. And then it will find all extensions in the catalog that match that name or that implement that extension. And then it can also get notified as packages get installed in real time or uh, get uninstalled. Uh, and once you have found out that an app is, a package has been installed that you're interested in, the host can then get the public folder, which if you remember is what we specified in the manifest of the extender, uh, and then it can get the content and start using it. Right, that's a lot of words. What does it look like? So um, I've got another demo here. And it is our old friend Photo Booth Pro. So um, this solution actually has got a number of solution projects in it. So first of all, we've got the Photo Booth Pro, Pro the basic Photo Booth Pro. But also in the same solution, I've got this um, Photo Booth Pro, Pro .effects extension. This is a separate project. It is actually an extension. You wouldn't need to have this in the same solution. This is a standalone app, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. But let's start off by running Photo Booth Pro. So this is kind of a trim, trimmed down version of what we were looking at in the keynote, the keynote this morning. Um, so we'll run this guy up. And we are deployed OK. And at the moment, it is just a selfie app. It has no other capabilities. I can take a, a photo. I could take another photo, and you could happily spend hours doing this. But there's no extensions on it at the moment. Now, um, when I back in Visual Studio, I previously went on to uh, to the extensions project down here, this guy, and I right I went to right click on it, and I went to store, and I went to create app packages. We're running, so it's blanked out at the moment. I created app packages, so those app packages are here. So let's go off and um, find the app package. So this is, this is the package that you would submit to the store, which it has in it the extension. So uh, this guy, just to uh, drill that home, in its manifest, let's view the code, this has in it, this is the ex one that's providing the extension. It has, um, it's, a, it's an app extension. It has a public folder called compiled shaders. So compiled shaders in the project, have a look back at Solution Explorer, is this guy here. So this is where all the public content is concerned. And the original app has in its manifest, um, view code, it has an app extension. But this is the app extension host, and it's looking for Photo Booth Pro extensions. So let's just put that back up there. And while we're doing, while we've got that, I'm going to just install 
I'm going to right click on this, run the add app dev package. So we're going to install this package on the system, run with PowerShell, and watch what happens behind. You can see the Photo Booth Pro behind. So that's now installed. And look, hey, all of a sudden, all those extensions, all those effects have been applied. The app is still running. So this happens in real time. You didn't have to close the app. It happens dynamically. And now, all of a sudden, I've got lots of interesting effects I can apply, like the edge detection. So that's pretty cool. And also now, let's just say, um, let's go to, uh, let's choose another one. Now I can go off away and uninstall that again. So I can go down here, uh, go to my apps. And this is, this is the one I just installed. That's the one we're running. This is the other one. And I'm going to uninstall it again. And it will, will uninstall it. And as it uninstalls, the uh, host app will detect it. And we're back to how we were before. So all that's happening dynamically, So which is a new addition to uh, the way you can have apps uh, communicate with each other. Let's have a, just another quick look at the, uh, the code for that. So that was that PowerShell. Uh, here we go. So the only thing I want to kind of call out is this is in the host, how it kind of detected all that sort of thing. So in our main page, we have this is where we go and look in the app extension catalog. We're looking for extensions that are named Photo Booth Pro extensions. We hook up the package installed, the package uninstalling. And in package, un package installed, this is where we process the fact that we've, uh, a, some, some app extension has been installed on this system that we're interested in. Uh, and what we do is we go into the catalog, find all packages in the catalog that are Photo Booth Pro ones. We get its public for each one that we find, there will only be one in this case, get the public folder. And in that folder, we get all the files. And all those files in there are actually, we also have a bit of um, application specific code, dot bin. Uh, and then we, um, for each of those we find, and these are shaders, so they're all these guys down here in the compiled shaders, those are, these implement all of those effects. Then we add them to the effects list, and that's how the app kind of consumes this. And we also got the, the, con the converse of that, so when the package gets uninstalled, they get removed again. So it's an interesting new way of having your apps. You know, uh, uh, enterprises could have a co cooperating apps. This might be interesting. Or you might want to open up your, your app as a platform because you see it as becoming you know, the, next, uh, uh, well, the, next, the next big social media or whatever, or next big platform for something. It's an interesting way of allowing other people to uh, add additional capabilities into your, uh, to your applications. OK, let's, uh, let's go back. So that was app extensions. Next up in our, in our collection of interesting features, handling web links. So this one is, uh, this is so, as I said before, the idea that you are, you've got an app and you've got various ways you're promoting that app. It might include uh, uh, stuff on web pages, and, and it might include emails. And all of these will include links, which might be links to, they'll, they'll be links to your website, because you want to obviously want to take people to the website uh, when they are clicking on something that they're interested in, and you drive them to the website. But, what we also want is the ability, if they've already got the app installed, you can have a much more direct uh, interaction with your end users, those who've already got your app, and offer special, uh, special links in emailings and that sort of thing that will allow them to launch straight into the app. It's something we've not been able to do before. So these are app URI handlers. Um, these, the idea is just take your users seamlessly to the content right in your application. Um, and the idea is that it will increase uh, increasing app launches and more engagement from users with your application. Uh, there's no kind of, uh, it all happens, happens on the system, so the, it, it, I'll show you how it goes, but there's a graceful fallback if it can't launch the app, then of course it will just fall back to the website. And the idea is we end up with happy users. Okay, so um, I've got another example here. So, Uh, yeah, another app from the Contoso stable. This is the uh, Contoso Cafe. In fact, this, this solution includes two projects. It has a website, Contoso Cafe Web. Um, the website is not terribly interesting. Uh, that's it. It's just a typical, uh, yeah, the sort of website I build all the time. Um, but the point is, the important thing from the point of this demo is it's got in, this, in the root this, a little JSON file. Microsoft app URI handlers.json. So this is how, where the magic happens. So you just need to put that in the root of your website. The important thing here is the package family name. That's this magic GUID here. That number matches the corresponding app. So this is on your website. But the app, look in the manifest, 
That's the same number there. So this is the, uh, the, your, your unique GUID for your application. And the system, when, when your, you, your user installs your app, they, will, uh, they know that that app is, is present on the system. Now, the application itself, Contoso Cafe, is a kind of a, a business promotion. It's kind of a, 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 a user engagement application for the Contoso Cafe. Cafe. Um, that's it. You just need to, I've just run it once, so it is installed on this system. And now let's go off to um, the mail app. And we've got um, a single email in here, which is a promotional email from, uh, from the Contoso Cafe, which is um, encouraging people to take advantage of the T, uh, the T for Two uh, uh, promotion. Now, if I hadn't had that app installed, I could click on this. If I just hover over it, you can see that the link is to contosocafe.azurewebsites.net. So it's going up to the website, as you might expect. That is the link. So if the app isn't installed, that's where clicking on this link will take people. But Actual fact, when you do this on a system where the app is in, then you get this uh, dialogue comes up saying, actually, oh, you, could, you could use the app. And in fact, you could, if you leave that checked thereafter, any links to, uh, to, to that uh, site will instead go to your, to your app. Um, I'm going to just uh, select that app and then click OK. And of course, now that's opened the app rather than gone off to the website. So that's a nice little thing, but it's something we've been asked about and something we've, we've implemented in the anniversary edition and a nice way for you, another way for you to engage with your end users. All right, so um, last but not least in this section. Uh, Windows Store. So um, there's a, I mean, the Windows Store is a continuing uh, development, loads of new features being added all the time to the store. So let's just pick out a few of them that are, um, are, are interesting. So obviously the store is where you know you interact with your, uh, you go to uh, submit your apps, it's where you, you define in-app purchases, it's where you uh, go for uh, um, diagnostics and get crash dumps and do all the kind of stuff that you need to do uh, to, uh, to work with your application. Um, all of these different options you can see on the left in the Dev Center, where, which allows you to interact with things. Now, of course, we've got a lot of interesting new features that might be of interest to you. Uh, first of all, we've got A-B testing coming. So A-B testing is an interesting thing. It allows you to set to, if you, you, and the reason why it's called A-B testing is you, you've got an idea for a new feature for your app. And you've got two choices. It could either be A or it could be B. And you're not perhaps sure which is the best option. So what you want to do is test it with a, a closed user group, a closed group of testers. And you send out basically um, version A to some of them and version B to the others. Or version A might be your regular app. And then you get, it allows you to trial test it with a, with a self-selecting group of users who are engaged with you. Um, and A-B testing allows you to try stuff out. You can get analytics back. And it makes it allows you to just give, give something a try and see how it goes down and then uh, get feedback. And then if, it's, if, if it gets acceptance from your testers, then you can roll it right out to the rest of your users. So that's nice. That's in the submissions bit of it. We also got flighting coming. So a lot of you put your hands up before. You're in the Windows Insiders program. So you know about getting fast ring and slow ring flights of Windows coming to your machines. And on that subject, we really do thank you very much for all the great work you guys do and all the fantastic feedback you give us, because it's really so invaluable. And you are helping to make the product better. And so thank you for that. But the good thing is now, you as app developers, you can do the same thing with your apps. So we're going to allow you to have flights, to do uh, beta flights out. And you could have your own fast ring and slow ring. Engage with your testers and your, your committed users and get direct feedback. Push out early versions to people and get feedback. Uh, another thing that uh, is going to be a, a great way of getting uh, good applications out there. So package flights is the feature. Um, and lastly, feedback. So uh, again, those of you who put your hand up, you'll be familiar with the feedback of the Windows Insiders hub, where you can give the feedback and you get asked questions. And you, know, you can go in there and, try and, and go into forums and give advice and give suggestions. And that's really great as well. Well, the feedback hub was in the, for insiders only. It's now going to everybody. So anybody can use the feedback hub to give us direct feedback. 
good or bad, we want to hear it all. Um, and that's going to be part of the, in, you know, in the regular product for the, the anniversary um, uh, edition update. Um, but the good thing is as well, we've got a nice a simple way for you as an app developer to then open that feedback hub and use that as the primary channel for users to give you feedback on your app. And you'll see it right here. If they've used the feedback hub from your app, you'll see that feedback right here in the dev center when these updates are rolled out a little bit later on. Give you a quick, um, quick example of how that works. I'm going to go back to um, where we started, actually. Uh, back into the, uh, the Contoso uh, app with the nice blur, the composition effects. So we go. I mean, they're very nice, lovely. Uh, login. There's no credentials, actually. Um, and we've got some number of options in here, which I'm, I'm going to. I'm just going to start with the feedback. And actually, in the next section, we're going to look at some of these others, because there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Um, so first of all, the, uh, the feedback hub is, um, uh, is, is a, a regular app. There are Feedback Hub, Trusted Windows Store app. But you can invoke it directly from here. So we've got a link on here. Hit the, click the Feedback, and it does launch the Feedback Hub. So this um, takes you straight into there. So um, you know we've got some what's new and a nice welcome page there. But this is where you can make suggestions. You can add, give feedback on the app or, of course, on Windows, the whole experience. So this is encouraging users to use this as the primary feedback uh, channel, uh, which we hope people will enjoy using. How do we do this? Really, really simple. Uh, first of all, this application has a reference to the the Microsoft Store Engagement SDK. So this Microsoft Store Engagement SDK um, is actually up in uh, uh, into extensions and updates. It's one of the ones we've got installed. The um, Microsoft Store Engagement SDK, they were one of the ones we installed on our system. We've referenced it from here. And that has all these APIs that allow you to engage with the store. Um, let's have a look at um, where that is. Um, not that guy. Oh, right. Let me see. Um, I'm blind here. Where is it? Oh, the report. No. no where is it? I can't find it. So the uh, feedback button click, that would be a good idea. Let's go there. There we are. This is it. Feedback button click. Dashboard.xaml.cs. Yes. Sorry, I got lost the plot there. And this is it. This feedback is supported. Feedback is in the Microsoft.services.store.engagement namespace. So you can just do a quick check to see if this facility is available where you are running at the time. And if it is, uh, feedback.launch feedback async. And that's what we use to just launch directly into the uh, feedback hub. Nice and easy, a nice feature to, uh, to uh, uh, engage with your users even more. OK, so that's, that kind of allows me to move smoothly on to just to wrap up that bit. This was about enriching a UWP app. So it was more about user engagement. We looked at composition, app extensions, handling web links, and the store. So that's all great. So now, actually, let's move on into building engaging experiences. This is uh, some of the mainly XAML and uh, features we've added to, uh, to this to uh, enable you to uh, have uh, you know, a really nice uh, uh, features in XAML, some of the new tools we've got, and that sort of thing. So first of all, Again, here's our lovely picture of the whole unified platform for all Windows devices. And of course, you know, we have got this ability. And I showed you a demo in the keynote this morning. We had one app running on across all of these four different devices. And actually, another one we didn't show, which might have been nice, which is the uh, continuum feature, where you've got a phone which acts like a PC, and that's on a big screen. So you know, it's really easy with UWP to create an experience that will go across all of these different devices, right from uh, phone, tablet, uh, the big screens, uh, living room, and right the way up to big Surface Hub uh, screens and wall-mounted displays. So, one app tailored for devices. And of course, what we don't want you to, we're not saying to you, you, all you need to do is create one lowest common denominator that kind of just about gets by on each of these screens. No, we, want, we give you the tools to create applications that really shine and your users are going to really love using. So how do we do all that with one UWP app? So there's a number of different 
features in the platform that enable you to build these kind of things. First of all, the universal controls. That when you go for the toolbox and you drag in a, you know, a, a map control or a, or a, a, a you know a list box, a, a list view, or something like that. All of these controls are sort of platform aware. They are aware of where they're running. They are aware of what the user's uh, input method is. So things like a drop-down list. If, it, if you're using touch, it will, it will expand out with sufficient white space that you've got nice hit targets. It's easy to use a finger. If it knows you're using a mouse, and it does, it will know whether you're using that, then it's more compressed, so it's, it's appropriate for a mouse. So you've got all that, these really built-in capabilities right into the controls, which is really great. We've got nice layout panels that allow you to flow content as the screen size changes width. You can have content that flows from one line to the next. Um, and you've got this scaling algorithm, effective pixels, is this logical pixel thing. So the idea here is that you can design your layout once for one size of screen, and then when it's shown on a bigger screen, it will look right, because we have this scaling algorithm which takes into a account the viewing distance. So the idea, you know, a phone, you tend to hold it in front of your face, a tablet's a little bit further out, obviously laptop, a bit more further out again. Then you've got the living room experience with the Xbox and obviously the Surface Hub and, and the HoloLens. Well, what sort of experience is that? Crazy stuff. Um, but these, the effect, the scaling thing means you don't have to create a specific UI for each of those experiences. You can create it once and then just tweak it a little bit because basically it will get it right. And we use, we are basically using the same adaptive layout techniques that web developers have been using for a, a quite a while. We've brought those into XAML. So you are using all the, the, the classical resize, re, uh, flow, and, uh, and move stuff around, all these kind of things. Uh, same, same models, same kind of techniques that web developers have been using uh, for adaptive web pages. And we showed you in the keynote this morning the, the uh, visual state triggers. This is how we use to detect in XAML what the screen size is. And the idea here is that you will define certain key screen breakpoints. So you'll kind of design for maybe a phone screen, um, a mid-sized tablet, and then a bigger one, and then any other ones you want to kind of Xbox and this sort of thing, you'll, you'll handle them. You don't have to create a million of different screen sizes. You, perfect it at specific points, and then using adaptive layout techniques, you'll, you'll hit all the one, the different screen sizes in between. And to enable all this, brilliant tooling. So in Visual Studio and Blend, you can actually visualize your designs very easily on different targets just by selecting from the drop-down which particular target you want to see it on. A whole bunch of new features in XAML as well, We're coming in the anniversary edition SDK. Uh, stacks of them um, with the loads of new controls, um, great new abilities that we gave you a, a taste of this morning for the Xbox, for example. Uh, great enhancements to data binding, to all sorts of things. And I'm going to now show you a few of these features um, right now. Back in our old friend Contoso, um, which um, I'm going to launch up again. So this is um, um, this is our uh, UI, and uh, at the moment we're on the home page. Uh, and actually, I'm just going to uh, let's go and dock this over on the right hand side, and we'll have Visual Studio up on the left. We're still debugging, so we're running away here. Now, how many of you here are XAML developers? Good number in the room. So you'll be familiar with this thing. You know, you're looking at this and you're thinking, oh, do you know what? This is all right, this screen, but what it really needs, what it really needs is a little rain cloud icon on the top right. I don't know why you'd want that, but um, let's let's say that's what you want to do. Um, let's go off to. Um, uh, oh, we're still, still searching for that thing. So let's go and have a look at the XAML for this uh, main page. Here's here's our XAML. Uh, this is what we're looking at right here. Um, but there's a bit of stuff down here, and you know, we, we tried this image before, and uh, we're not sure whether we like it. So we've been doing this testing, and it's currently commented out. But actually, and here we are, we're still debugging. And I'm just going to edit this on the fly. And bang, there we go. So this is real time. XAML, edit and continue. This is you can change your XAML now and not have to come out of the debugger. How cool is that? Eh? Mm -hmm. 
So this is really cool, because in the old the work cycle flow before was, oh, I want to change this, so you stop debugging, you go in and change it, and then you run it again. No, I didn't get it quite right, stop debugging, go and change it. Well, you can just change it on the fly now. Maybe we want to just move that over a little bit. Uh, let's make it a little bit bigger, or width 150. Whoa, there we go. So that that's really enhances my login screen. Well, that's a bit debatable, but... Um, you know, and uh, the other thing to call out about this, the sharp-eyed amongst you will have noticed that this is an animated GIF, which we didn't support until now. So I expect to see lots of little, lovely little annoying animated GIFs turn up in your apps from now on. So that's really cool. That was edit and uh, continue. Now, um, on to the next feature. Uh, let's just let's get this in front. Uh, we'll log into this. Um, there we go. Um, there's another bit of nice composition stuff going on there. Now, the other th another thing we've uh, been asked about as well. So, you know, as developers, we hate using the mouse, and we really much prefer to use keyboard shortcuts. And uh, we've had a lot of requests for uh, keyboard, you know, access keys. Well, now I can just press the Alt key on my system here, and these uh, these uh, shortcuts are coming up. So, these this now we've got for each of these, we have actually got. Um, uh, access keys set up so I can go Alt M and it will take you know it will go straight into that feature. There we go into the message feature. How's that done? Well, very simple. Thank you. Yeah, one person loves that. I love it too. Come on, let's hear about it for the access keys. Yeah. All right. So and, yeah, let's see. Then the um, access keys they're on. Um, they're going to be on the uh, dashboard.xaml. There we go. So really easy to, uh, to add these. Um, all we've got here is here's our buttons, message button, and these report button, selfie button, feedback button. But now we've got access key equals M, R, S, and F. So defined it right there in attributes. Uh, you can localize these as well, of course. And uh, access key display requested. We've got a couple of events that are related to access key request and dismissed. Um, and then, of course, we've got a click event on that. Let's go and have a look at the code uh, for this. Uh, go to definition. So uh, all we've done in the code behind here is we've set up a bunch of tool tips for, uh, for the access key so we can feed back to the user what's available. So here we are. This is just defining the um, access key content for the, each of the tool tips. We're positioning them uh, to the right of the, each corresponding button. And then we're setting that tool tip on that button. And then in access key display requested, we simply show the tool tips, which is why the, those were visible. Uh, and then here we actually close it again when the, when the uh, Alt key is pressed again. So that's really nice. That's the access keys. Um, so. Um, so that's the tool, tool kit, the tool tip stuff that all does all that sort of thing. Um, the next thing I want to show you is uh, in here. It was actually where we are just here. So uh, you know, here we are. Here we are in London, uh, and you know, I can add this to my list, and it goes onto the onto the list. This list view. We can add a few more of these, and when we get down to the bottom, what we're doing here, we've got this now. This uh, list is refreshing. It's automatically going to the bottom, and the bottom item is being kept in focus all the time. This is the classical chat application uh, scenario. Uh, we've had a lot of requests. This was one of those things that, you know, if you were trying to write this, it's, you think, oh, how hard can this be? And then three hours later, you're going, I don't believe how hard this could be. Uh, that's because it did used to be a little bit more code than it is now. In fact, right now, it is very trivial. So let's have a look at uh, messages.xaml. The way that is implemented, um, here we go. Here's our messages list view, this guy here. And all we have done to get that new behavior, first of all, obviously, we are showing in this list view the messages collection. Um, but here, we've overridden the container for the items in this list view. Now, by default, it's an item stack panel. But by default, this attribute property is not set. So all we've done is we've overridden the items panel. And in the template defining what we've overridden it with, we said, you know what, use an item stack panel, but set the items updating scroll mode to keep last item in view. So that's, uh, that's the item updating scroll mode. So you can now all go off and write uh, chat applications. So that's really cool. 
Something else I want to show you in here. So that's a lot of UI-related stuff, but most of us here, I'm sure, when you're writing apps, you spend a lot of time writing a lot of unnecessary code around data binding. I mean, data binding is a really powerful tool. It allows you nice separation, especially using good models like MVVM, lovely separation between your view models, your data, and your UI. So uh, we've got a few things that I can show you around that. So first of all, um, let's go and have a look at the uh, app again. Report. So this is a capability in here in this application. There are a number of reports that we can. Uh, uh, we're, calling, we're calling up some data items here. So these inspiring titles: energetically optimized cross-media products and rapid. Who thought this stuff up? Anyway, but you see, we've got for each of these, we are using data binding to show the corresponding data item. Now the way this is done, let's first of all have a look at the data item that we're showing on there. So back up in Solution Explorer, we've got this report view model. This is the object that encapsulates the data that is being shown there. And you'll see that it's a, 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 classical, report, uh, a classical view model implements our notify property changed. It's got a name property on it and a title property on it. They're both strings. Those are the kind of familiar properties on a view model you might uh, have used in the past. But this one, probably not. Dictionary string decimal. So this one, data. We've got a dictionary in here, uh, and with this, some of the so, so, some more sort of variable data is in this dictionary. So a dictionary just has a string key and then a value associated with that string key. But if you wanted to show that on your UI, you would have to kind of do some stuff in here, like implement some top-level properties in your view model just to surface the appropriate data and then have some logic behind to, to read the dictionary and set those properties. Complicated stuff that you didn't really want to have to write. So now in, uh, in the uh, UI, report.xaml, and now in our data binding, well, OK, we get selected report.title. So that's the title string that, that, that we saw before. Uh, so there's our title. But there, now, select a report dot data, square brackets, budget. So now we are going into our dictionary here, our data dictionary, supplying a string key of budget and getting the data out of that and showing that. So now you can data bind directly into that. There's a whole lot of other stuff in data bind, including, what's this? Get formatted text. What is this? Well, if we look in the code behind, the get formatted text method is here. So here we are, get formatted text. It's, um, or it's, you pass in the, view, the data object, which is a report view model. If the data is null, we just return null. But otherwise, here we got just got some code to pull out, again, from our data dictionary, the budget. But we're doing a to string on it. So we're formatting that data right in a simple method. So this is new as well. You can data bind to methods. So just go back to, to reinforce that. This is calling a method, which could be, uh, which could be in your view model. It's in this case, it's in, uh, it's in the actual code behind of your page. And there's other stuff. We can do actually string.format sort of stuff right in XAML. That's coming up. Now, a lot of these features I've shown you, such as the edit and continue, that's in the uh, rather confusingly named Visual Studio, Visual Studio 15, which is not Visual Studio 2015. It's Visual Studio version 15, which is the next one that's coming. So previews out there. You can already use these features. It's out there. In fact, it's gone through a couple of um, updates already. And that's what you can use for doing the, some of this cool stuff. All right. So that is uh, all of that. So that's just some of the investments we've made on uh, the XAML. And uh, next, I'm going to just have a little bit of a deeper dive. We had a brief look at this this morning. Uh, but let's have a quick look at something talking about UWP on Xbox. So this is new. You, anybody who's got an Xbox One, you can now turn your Xbox into a dev machine. And you can develop your own Xbox. You can UWP apps and run them up on the Xbox. And we've done a lot of work to make it happen easily for you. So a lot of work in the platform. Um, but there's still a lot of things that you want to test for. The key one, of course, being that you're using a gamepad. So uh, with a regular UWP app, you're probably using a soft keyboard or a real keyboard and a mouse or finger and that sort of thing. But with the Xbox experience, the 10-foot experience uh, across the living room, then they're using a gamepad. So you want to think about apps that are heavily you know, data entry. That's really not going to be a good experience for users. Um, certainly look at Cortana and speech input and all that kind of thing. That's a really cool way of interacting with an Xbox app. But you need to think also about focus visualization. Is it logical for your user? Focus engagement. Um, 
you know, all these kind of things. Thinking about the UI size. Now, again, we size things quite, you know, we do quite a lot in the platform to make things kind of bigger so it looks appropriate, but you might want to tweak that for your, uh, for your own application. Um, we've got colors. The color actually palette is slightly different. So, you know, don't just take your, your um, app with the, that you've created and, and proven with your own graphics and your own nice branding and just run it straight on the Xbox. You want to check that out because the colors on the TV are somewhat different. So you need to test it on there. Um, but it's, it, we have done a lot in the platform to make it easy for you. Now, I'm going to just show you an example on here, which is... It's actually a UWP app. I'm going to run it on the PC, but it's to actually show you um, what it's like um, for running on the Xbox. So you can do a lot of testing for Xbox just running it right on your PC. So there's a lot to talk about in here, but here we are obviously in uh, the application. I've got an um, Xbox controller that's actually plugged in directly to the PC here. Um, so uh, you know we can we can use the the, the controller to navigate through uh, to uh, the, all these the different uh, the nice filters, pretty cool, huh? Uh, and uh, you know we can go off to the uh, uh, off to the, um, the 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 split view here. I can go off to the photo gallery. So uh, and I'm just using the you know normal navigation. Now it's one of the interesting things about this is uh, if I go over, is that obviously you're using the the gamepad to navigate around. And in general, what we do is we look at the layout of controls in a UWP app, and we kind of just try and do the right thing. So uh, I can navigate right and this sort of thing. Um, and actually, you can hear sounds as well. We've got the sound. Now the sound's interesting because. By default, that is enabled when your app is running on Xbox. You don't have to turn it on. And obviously, by default on UWP, on, on, on desktop, it's turned off. But I've actually overridden that in this, so you can hear the sounds. So that's, uh, that's enabled in here. Um, and we can navigate down and this sort of thing. And here we've got a long list. But this is where you need to start thinking about navigation. So I'm navigating down the list list. But maybe I want to get down to that set size slider down the bottom. You know, how do we do that? So uh, and I can keep on navigating down the list. But what if this was an infinite list? You know, you'd never get there. So you might want to think about um, implementing some other things to enable this, this to get down to it. And if you, when you do get down to uh, set size here, what happens then when I go left or right? So are we going to move to the, if we go right, are we going to the reset button? Or are we going to move the slider? And in fact, at the moment, we're moving the slider. And at the moment, there's no way on this application, and so this is part of the testing process, there's no way of getting to that reset button. So you're going to need to think about how you do that. And in fact, uh, running on Xbox, we've got some additional capabilities on a slider where you can set focus to kind of a, a child element of a control. So we get this focus rectangle uh, would appear on the slider, and then you could go right and uh, navigate to get to that reset button. And then you can also use the obviously you know the, the normal buttons on the controller as well. So uh, on this one, we've enabled the uh, uh, the Y to go straight up to the search effect at the top. So you might think about uh, doing a feature like that to allow somebody to do that. And also the menu button uh, it, that toggles the uh, the split view out on the left there. So. A lot of, lot of work's been done for you, but you do need to test it out and just make sure you've got a, a, a really good uh, user experience for users on the Xbox. Right, uh, Windows Inc. So Windows Inc. is a really, uh, really cool experience. Um, with a huge amount of investment has gone into uh, Windows Inc. Um, on uh, this uh, in the anniversary edition. Well, there's a lot of new stuff gone in already. Um, but the, uh, the thing about Inc., I mean, we've been trying to do this for years, and um, I've seen a former colleague of mine in the room, so we used to make our living back in the noughties doing lovely pocket PC apps with a nice stylus and this sort of thing, and, and many of you will have um, had parcels delivered to your door and been asked to sign on the screen, and you'll also know that that's not a great experience, is it? You know, how, how many, how does your, it, it never looks anything like your signature. And, but it, it's good enough for them, they just want some kind of mark. But actually, inking on small screens has not been a great experience up to now. And you know, we, we and other manufacturers have been trying to do this for years. Writing with ink is just such a natural thing. Uh, you know, shouldn't this be a first party way of interacting with computing devices? 
Well, we think so, and we're trying very hard to make that happen. So our latest generation of hardware, and we've been doing a huge amount of work right down to the low level with one core, making sure that inking on a screen on a device like a Surface Pro or a Surface Book is a first-class experience. And really, it's all about the latency. You know this thing where you, you were using a, a stylus, a pen on the screen, and you're drawing on the screen, and then the actual ink appears on the screen ways after you've done it. There's that lag. That's kind of all that experience. It just makes it not a satisfying thing. We've really been driving that latency out, so we've really got, some, uh, some, uh, got a great experience with ink. So we want to make this really a, a great tool for artists, a great tool for just jotting things down. And obviously, our, uh, all our convertible devices, like the Surface, where you can use it as a tablet. They're ideal for you switching between keyboard and uh, ink uh, as appropriate. And we've got some great, great new controls, the Ink Canvas and the Ink Toolbar, which are really easy to use controls. You can drill down, of course, in the API set, get right down into the Ink Presenter and do some advanced stuff. But for most of you, just the top level is going to be all you need. So let's just show you how easy it is to add inking in. So um, into Visual Studio again, and this time I'm just going to do a file, new project. Uh, blank app, app 3, yeah, why not? App 3 is great. And now for this one, because I'm going to use the new features, I do need to uh, select the latest version of the um, anniversary SDK that's on this machine is 14.3.42. Um, so I'm selecting that as my both as the minimum and the target. Um, so here we are. We're going to, um, uh, we're creating our project. Here we go. So we've got our new project, and I'm just going to go in a minute into main page. Just going to create a very simple example of how easy it is to add inking. So here we go in, uh, into our XAML. Um, let's, let's add ourselves an ink uh, canvas. So an ink canvas is the control that, um, that you, you enables ink input. I'm going to give it a, um, a name, my canvas, because I'm going to refer to it in just a moment. And actually, for starters, that's all I need, because that inside that grid, by default, the horizontal um, stretch is set to stretch, and the vertical alignment is set to stretch. So that will just fill the entire page, the grid area. Uh, but we want to have ourselves the toolbar as well. We've got a brilliant new toolbar control. So let's just select the ink toolbar. Now, I need to have the, uh, say, you can actually simply Target, say what the canvas is that this toolbar applies to. So there's an actual, a property called target in canvas. And I'm going to use in that an X bind, because I'm just going to bind to the control I just named above, which is my canvas. So that's that target. I'm going to set the horizontal alignment to be right. Um, and I'm going to set the vertical alignment to be uh, top. So it's positioned top right on my page. Um, and actually, for this blue squiggles, because we're still not at the final release, don't worry about that. If I run that on here, and I've got attached to the side of my uh, Surface Book here, I've got uh, one of these lovely uh, pens. And straight away, I've got an ink area I can do. By default, we just got this red. Let's, let's change a couple of things, change to a nice uh, the red there, and we can change the size. Here we go, and we'll have a highlighter pen. And, this, and so I'm no artist, as you can see, but it's, it's really nice. And um, Kevin showed you this, more, this the uh, ruler. This is really cool, the ruler, because you can just use a couple of fingers to position that. And then anything, let's just change to, uh, to a, a biro. Anything then I draw just goes as a straight line. So it's really easy to do precision work with straight lines, which, of course, as you'll know, anybody who's tried this, is really hard to do unless you have something like this nice ruler. So that's really cool. A uh, nice feature that really makes it easy to, uh, to give your users a great uh, inking experience. And that's what it's about. If they enjoy using it, they'll make use of it. So um, please think about putting inking into your, uh, into your apps in future. Um, it's uh, got a lot of great, great applications for, in all sorts of ways for giving a good user experience. All right, so that was engaging user experiences. About a little, little time insight. We haven't got a lot of time, of course, but a little insight into some of the cool stuff we're doing. I showed you what was new, some of the stuff that was new in XAML, some of the great tooling we've got coming up in Visual Studio 15. Um, we looked a little bit about extending your apps to Xbox One and then a little bit about Windows Inc. there at the end. Great, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it's, um, we're going to have a break now, and uh, then we'll be back for a bit more. Thank you.